Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today we're going to begin to build a completely open source fantasy tabletop role-playing game. That's right. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. And first, I want to point out this is all off the cuff. None of this is scripted. And if you follow the Gaming Gang, you know many of my videos are like this. Also, this video is in some ways a response to Open Game License 1.1, or I guess now we have to call it Open Game License 2.0, as well as that ridiculous announcement Wizards of the Coast made by way of D&D Beyond yesterday. So I know there are a lot of people out there that are very, very upset about the Open Game License and other things currently going on with Wizards of the Coast. They're frustrated. They feel betrayed, pissed off. And I have to say, our hobby should never make anyone feel that way. Our hobby is all about fun, excitement, community, having a good time with your friends. We should never feel bad because we want to play a role-playing game ever. So this video is not about the open game license want to get that right out there it has really nothing to do with it but it is being spurred by the open game license fiasco now i had planned on rolling out a monthly series where i was going to look at old tsr D, D modules and discuss them and playing them at your table now and what kind of adjustments you could you could make and how you could utilize them with a lot of different role-playing games out there that didn't have to be D&D. &D. Well, with the current atmosphere as it is, and I am not thrilled with Wizards of the Coast either, I am not going to be sharing that series. So what I was thinking about is just kind of talking about us creating a completely open source fantasy tabletop role-playing game and how it's not really... A Herculean task to do so. Now, there are things about fantasy role playing games that take a lot of time, effort, and intellectual horsepower, right? And those tend to usually break down into the combat system, the monsters and NPCs and creatures, things like that, and the magic system. So, those are the three things that really tend to derail a homebrewed role-playing game. So I will talk about those aspects of a fantasy tabletop role-playing game in later videos if you like this video. But today I want to talk about attributes and a basic action resolution system. What is the mechanic that we're going to utilize the vast majority of the time to resolve tasks and challenges, which you want to roll dice for. You don't want to roll dice every time a character does anything. Oh, that door's unlocked. It's not stuck, but I still need you to roll to open it. No, that is never supposed to be the approach to a role-playing game. So we want to stick to relatively easy mechanics to wrap your head around, but we are not going to be dipping our toes anywhere near the Dungeons and Dragons system reference document or the open game license. So please keep that in mind. This is supposed to be a lightweight, fun video series that I am proposing. So I am going to share ideas, kind of bounce them off of you, kind of spitball this. And if you like these ideas, please let me know in the comment section. If you hate these ideas, please let me know in the comment section. If you feel that I'm not the brightest bulb on the string, which is the case sometimes, and you got a great idea, please let me know in the comments section. And of course, if you would like to see me continue this series of videos, you guessed it, please let me know in the comments section. So let's swing on over to the other camera because I have a whiteboard Yes, granted, it's a cheapo dollar store whiteboard, but it's a whiteboard nonetheless. So 
Let's start off, let's give this a title, just a working title, right? We're going to call this the Gaming Gang Game. Reason why is in the early years of the Gaming Gang, and even still sometimes to this day, when I'm at a convention or Elliot and I, when Elliot was part of the gang, we're covering conventions and we'd go up to a publisher that didn't really know us and we weren't overly familiar with them and we would introduce ourselves. A lot of times the person we were talking to would ask the gaming game. We would have to say, no, no, the gaming gang. And of course we had business cards and stuff, but you know, a lot of times people didn't look at the card. So I got a chuckle calling this the gaming gang game. T triple G. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about attributes as well as our core mechanic. And I don't want this to be like an hour long video either. I just want to share some ideas, bounce them off you. If you like them, we'll keep stuff in. Do you want to mention, I do come from an old school Renaissance mindset that is mainly because I started role playing in 1978. So there is that. I like that feel. Now, that doesn't mean I am just going to regurgitate uh, the same mechanics that we find in, you know, D&D and, you know, BX, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons or anything like that. But I do like the old school mentality. But I am also a fan of lighter weight mechanics and a simple mechanic which most of the gameplay is based around. So do want to point that out as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about are those attributes. And I know some people out there think, well, you can't call things strength and intelligence and dexterity because that's in the SRD. It's open game license. That is absolutely not the case. Those words existed long before Dungeons and Dragons was even a thought in anyone's head. But let's not use those terms. Let's use different terms. So first off, let's say we've got might. And of course, might will be important to fighters, martial type characters. So that'll be an important attribute for them. Then we've got agility. And agility will be important for, let's say, thieves, archers, right? Because we want to still make this game feel kind of familiar for people who have played fantasy role-playing games. We just don't want to repeat the same exact mechanics and that which you would find in other like retro clones and things of that sort. Let's have fortitude. And the way I'm looking at this is fortitude will be very important as far as your health points. So the way I'm kind of proposing, and, and this is something I'll talk about in another video, but where your fortitude is kind of your base as far as your health points, which of course is, really how much damage you could absorb before taking a dirt nap. And then your archetype, your sort of character is going to modify that as well as, as you advance, which I'm not looking at having levels. I'm looking at having ranks because then I can use that term for the player characters. I can use that for monsters, spells, rank. I like that term. I like that term rank. So let's say you had a fortitude of 14, then you're going to start off with 14 health points, regardless of the sort of character you are. So if you were a magic using character, then you're still going to have those 14 points. So that's what fortitude would be. Then we'll have intellect. I'm certainly hoping that I don't misspell something. <laughs> look like a complete doofus this will be important for wizards arcane magic users 
I had almost considered maybe calling this Arcana, Arcana, however you want to pronounce it. But this will be important for other things as well. So deducing something, coming to a conclusion from clues, things like that. So we've got intellect. We also have enlightenment, which will be shaman, warrior priests, things like that. Say priests. And I got to be honest, I don't necessarily know if we have to have a charisma sort of attribute. I know some people really dig having something that's like charisma. And I know the wording early on in D&D was, you know, it's, it's how appealing you are, how pretty you are, how handsome you are. And nowadays, it's more force of personality. So... I'll put a little asterisk here, and I'll put personality. Like I said, I'm not totally sold on this, but this is really any character. We're not going to have any sort of archetype that's necessarily built on personality. We could. I mean, we could eventually do something like that. But as far as, like, the various different archetypes, occupations, we're going to kind of keep it small to start with. Once again, I'll talk about that in another video down the line. So there we have that. Now, I happen to also be a big fan of the 3 to 18 range for our attributes or abilities, whatever you want to consider these to be. Once again, looking at keeping something familiar we're not looking to make something radically different just for the sake of being radically different because that just really doesn't work. So I like the 3 to 18 range. So we've got a variety of ways that we could actually get these scores. We could take 3D6, the traditional old school way, and just roll them in order, and those are our totals. We could do that. We could add an extra D6, roll 4, and deduct the lowest score. We could do that as well. Personally, what I like is presenting a buy system. So you would have so many points to start off with that you could spend on your attributes. And I'll explain why this is important when I talk about our core action resolution mechanic. But I like the fact that you can assign the ability scores however you want, right? You can, you can buy into it. Now, I don't want to get crazy because, for one, I don't want our starting characters to be really powerful. I want them to be heroic, but I don't want them superheroes right off the bat. Once again, I sort of have that old-school mentality. Now, I don't want them to be super squishy. That's why I was talking about the fortitude. So, you know... Old school, oh, you're a wizard? Well, here you go. Enjoy that D4. Oh, look, you got two hit points. Wonderful. I'm not going in that direction. But I, I do want to make these attributes more important than they usually are in, say, a retro clone. Because depending on the system, especially if you're using a D20 mechanic where you're looking to roll high to succeed, where you're looking to exceed a number, these usually just break down into modifiers. So as an example, let's say somebody had a, a might of 13. Well, they get a plus one to their D20 roll. Now you could have a might of 15, and depending on the system, that might still only get you that plus one modifier. It could be 13 to 15 gets you plus one, that is a possibility. And then it's usually 16, 17 plus 2, 18 gets you plus 3, and that's your max. So that's not something I want to do. What I want to do as far as our core action resolution mechanic is that you're rolling a d20, and you're looking to roll less than the associated attribute for whatever task or challenge 
that you're going to take on. And of course, we don't want to be rolling dice constantly all willy-nilly. And I know there are some game masters out there who do that. But personally, I'm not looking at a situation where it's like, oh, well, okay, so that door is not locked and it's not stuck, but I need you to roll to see if you can open it. Now, dice rolls in role-playing games should be meaningful because if you roll dice for everything, then rolling dice suddenly becomes kind of meaningless. So what I would propose is that if we're using five attributes that we give the players 60 points to break down into five. Now, if we were to go with six, let's say 72 points. And what that allows is an average of 12 as far as the scores. But it also allows us to custom tailor these attributes for the sort of character you want to play. So let's say, for an example, you want to play a warrior who is also smart. You could pull that off. Now, of course, you're going to have to take points away from something else. Now, maybe you're taking away from enlightenment, which enlightenment will not only be for priests. Enlightenment will also be your perception or how in tune with the world you are around you. So don't think like intellect. Intellect isn't only going to be for wizards. It'll be used for other things as well, just like agility, just like fortitude, just like might. So the reason why I also like the roll less than the attribute mechanic is twofold. One, even powerful characters will fail. There should always be that chance of failure. And of course, we could always have, there's always a chance to succeed. So on a roll of 20, automatic failure. I'm not necessarily saying critical failure, although I would be interested in, in building something into the magic system with failure. And once again, I would discuss that when we talk magic. And a one would be an automatic success. So characters always have a chance of succeeding. So I like the fact that powerful characters can still fail. And we also build the, the possibility of spending points with your advancement to increase your attributes. So I like that as well. So the reality would be starting characters can't have an attribute score higher than 14 that they purchase. Now, of course, it's a fantasy role-playing game. We have to include other species as well, outside of just the humans. So we could have positive and negative modifiers as well for elves and dwarves and so on and so forth. Once again, elves and dwarves are not part of the open game license. The concept of those creatures existed long before D&D. &D. So please keep that in mind. But even with the modifiers from species, we still would only have a max of 15. So that would still make characters to have higher chances of success in attributes that they would focus on, but still not be overpowered to begin with. So that's sort of how I'm looking at the attributes. Now, as far as the core action resolution mechanic, as I said, low is good, high is bad, except for when you're going to be rolling for damage in combat, then you want to roll high. I have a lot of ideas on how to make combat quick moving, but still exciting. Not that typical, oh, okay, I need a 17 or higher to hit. Ah, I missed. And that's it. Just like Personally, I feel using these attributes numerically as opposed to just adding a bonus to a die roll adds the ability to role play and it also becomes uh, very conducive for the game master to 
do things on the fly. So as an example, let's say somebody needed to succeed at agility and their agility is 13 and they rolled right on that 13. So what you could do is you could make that 13 to be a failure, but right. Okay. So you didn't exactly pull it off, but maybe something good came out of it or maybe you failed, but you're closer to succeeding something along those lines. We could even advance it to the point where if you succeed within one. So once again, I was saying an agility 13. I'm showing a 12 here. Okay, so I succeed, but you just did it by the skin of your teeth. You just pulled it off. And maybe something negative is associated with that as well. Like I said, you can, you can add in some additional opportunities for interesting situations and role-playing far more than just having a plus one or a plus two to your D20 roll. So that is sort of what I'm looking at as far as our core action resolution mechanic and our attributes become far more important for each of the characters and it actually makes them more unique. So it becomes, there is a difference between a might of 13 and a might of 15. It's a big difference, not just, well, you just get that plus one modifier. So to start off with the gaming gang game, I would propose these attributes once again, if you like personality being in there, let me know. If you want to take it out, let me know. I'm also considering skills based on the archetype the player characters are, but making those skills simply a modifier. I don't want to go into a bunch of details about, you know, oh, okay, this feat does this in these situations, but not, you know, kind of make them not so specialized their skills but it's not like the minutia of that skill is what i'm kind of looking at kind of considering of course once again that would be in a different video down the line so there you have it my proposed starting attributes and our core mechanic for our open source fantasy tabletop role-playing game. I don't know. What do you think? Like I said, let me know in the comment section. So I've got a lot of different ideas as far as building an open source fantasy role-playing game together, right? This is not something that we would, oh, well, now, you know, we're going to put this on sale or anything like that. Maybe we could compile a PDF and allow people to just grab it for free, or you can sit there and, and plug in whatever sort of mechanics you want into this system. Cause that's something else I would like to do is make this kind of modular. So like, as an example, like skills, I was just talking about skills, maybe just make it some sort of a modifier. Plus I also want to put a limit on how many modifiers there would be to a, a particular die roll or any die roll. Like, can't be more than two positive or two negative modifiers. You take the highest because I don't want this to become a game of, all right, well, hang on. Let me bust out the calculator here. This should be super easy math to do on the fly and be able to roll your dice and play. Rolling dice should never get in the way of a story that you're enjoying. It shouldn't slow things down to a crawl. Anyway, so that's it for my first video. Once again, please let me know what you think. If you want to see me kind of push this further and talk about monsters and combat, like I said, I've got some ideas about combat, give you a clue, opposed roles, and whoever rolls lowest underneath their needed roll is actually gonna be the one who does damage. So you could have the attacker 
actually be taking damage because the defender rolls far better than the attacker did. I kind of like that. Also, I'm not looking at something like an armor class. So it's a flurry of blows taking place during the combat round, and we would have damage reduction. We would also have damage to your armor and shields breaking and things like that, but not getting too crunchy and into the weeds with the rules surrounding them. You know, just a little preview. All right. So if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. If you do subscribe, ding that bell. Because not only will you be informed when I upload videos such as this, you'll also get to know when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. Thanks so much for taking a peek at this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was, you know, lightweight and, eh, you know, better than poking the eye with a sharp stick. And of course, until I see you next time, here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.